This episode is brought to you by Tegas. Over the years of our partnership with Tegas, they have evolved from a pure expert network into a full company intelligence platform. I've been so impressed by the platform that my firm, Positive Sum, recently made an investment in Tegas. We did so because we feel that Tegas will be the gold standard platform for investing research for decades to come. Tegas streamlines the investment research process so you can get up to speed and find answers to critical questions on companies faster and more efficiently. The Tegas platform surfaces the hard-to-get qualitative insights, gives instant access to critical public financial data through BAM SEC, and helps you set up customized expert calls. It's all done on a single modern SaaS platform that offers 360-degree insight into any public or private company. As a listener, you can take Tegas for a free test drive by visiting tegas.co slash Patrick. And until 2023, every Tegas license comes with complimentary access to BAM SEC by Tegas, which makes it easy to search and analyze public company filings and transcripts. This episode is sponsored by Delupa. Delupa streamlines a major pain point for investors. By capturing all of a company's KPIs and adjusting financials into their database, Delupa makes it easy to quickly update your models for what matters. So many investors I speak to complain about juggling multiple company earnings or rushing to ramp on a new investment. Delupa uses AI to find every KPI disclosed, from charts to text, and even from footnotes of investor presentations. Delupa updates these KPIs and data points in your existing Excel models in one click, regardless of your source or format. Try Delupa for free at delupa.com slash Patrick. This is Business Breakdowns. Business Breakdowns is a series of conversations with investors and operators diving deep into a single business. For each business, we explore its history, its business model, its competitive advantages, and what makes it tick. We believe every business has lessons and secrets that investors and operators can learn from, and we are here to bring them to you. To find more episodes of Breakdowns, check out joincolossus.com. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions. Hosts, podcast guests, their employers, or affiliates may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. This is Zach Fuss, an investor at Irenic Capital, and today we are breaking down into it. Started by a former Procter & Gamble employee in 1983, Intuit has grown into the premier platform for consumers and small businesses to manage their finances and pay their taxes. Along the way, it has fought off significant competition from the likes of Microsoft and others and delivered handsome returns for its shareholders. In recent years, it has spent over $10 billion in cash and stock, adding Credit Karma and MailChimp to its platform of services. To break down this $100 billion plus market cap company, I'm joined by John Feely, Deputy CIO and Portfolio Manager at Finlay Park. Please enjoy this business breakdown of Intuit. Okay, John, thank you for joining us to break down Intuit. Intuit is one of the largest personal, prosumer, and professional accounting software companies globally, but it's fascinating to me that a business with such a storied history has very little in the way of brand recognition. If you can just set the scene by telling us what Intuit does and how big is it, that'd be a great starting point. Thanks, Zach. Intuit is an almost 40-year-old software company that's sustained through different technology cycles. And it's been one of the very best and most durable compounders in the technology space. So if you picture the brands under its umbrella, TurboTax, QuickBooks, Credit Karma, which now subsumes Mint, which some people would have heard of, and more recently, MailChimp. And across those brands, they've amassed around $13 billion of revenue last year and trades at a market cap of around $120 billion. And so if we can just dig a bit deeper about the size and scope of those four brands and who the key customers are for each one of them. Let's start with consumer tax. So to set the scene, the US runs a self-assessment system for federal and state taxes. So each year in the run-up to April, around 40% of Americans file their own taxes without the aid of an accountant. It's generally cheaper to do so, but you need to have some confidence that you can actually answer the questions and confidence that you'll withstand an audit and you're going to get the best refund possible. Of those who choose to do it that way, about 30% file their taxes with Intuit's TurboTax. And that's about 35% of total revenue. The next bucket is small business and self-employed software. 
And so that's just over half of revenue last year. And in that segment, they really lead with a family of bookkeeping solutions called QuickBooks that have around 90% share in the US within their category. And those products are aimed at businesses with between one and 10 employees. So picture your local restaurant or lawn mowing firm or plumber. They'll use the software to keep their accounting records and purchase orders, they'll record inventory, maybe they'll issue invoice to customers. There's around 6 million businesses using that platform out of 75 million addressable customers that Intuit think they can get to over time. So less than 10% penetrated. And they also offer payroll solutions to pay employees and merchant services to accept payment of invoices. Put those two segments together, you've got about 80% of the revenue. So let's call them the core for now. And then the last couple of years, Intuit made two relatively larger acquisitions by their standards. The first was Credit Karma, which is used by 40 million users every month to monitor their credit score and see what products they can apply for without any deterioration being caused in their credit score by failed applications. And then MailChimp, which is really a sort of email management, customer relation, ship management tool for small businesses. On those last two, I, you know, I get the sense that investors are trying to figure out where those pieces fit. And I'm sure we can double click on that later on. And so if I kind of think about Intuit and the evolution of it, the founding story to me kind of has analogs to Richard Barton's Power to the People framework. They're giving people, consumers, professionals with small businesses, the technology they need to self-service themselves and increase transparency, which presumably should should unlock opportunity for them. If we kind of take a step back and just talk very briefly about how the company was founded and why and how they went from Quicken to the small business accounting and consumer tax business they are today. The analog you've drawn to Rich Barton and his philosophy is really apt. So so another thing he's out there with is having described that the best consumer-facing technologies is a mixture of art and science. So his description of the art bit is around having really deep empathy with your customers' problems and being imaginative about how to solve them. And the science piece then is how you use data and feedback loops to continue to improve the user experience. So let's get to Scott Cook in 1983, the founder of Intuit. So unlike Rich Barton or archetypal tech founders, Scott is not a technologist by background. In fact, he was a marketeer whose formative years were spent at Procter & Gamble. And frankly, P&G has this great lineage of developing superior consumer understanding. They conduct lots of experimentation. They're maniacal about gathering feedback loops and running focus groups. And many of their best innovations have come from those type of lenses on the consumer. So not long after Scott left P&G, he was confronted by a real-life customer problem, watching his wife trying to manage the family checkbook at the kitchen table. And these were the days long before internet banking or live statements. To pay your bills each month, you had to manually write out numerous checks and then keep a running total of incomings and outgoings. You know, if you left this task to lasting on a Sunday night, it was pure drudgery. So personal computers were becoming popular. And Cook was inspired to think that a computer program could save people like his wife from this you know, mundane task but he didn't have the tools to implement it. So he drove down to Stanford's campus with a help wanted sign and enlisted the help of an undergrad called Tom Prue. And together, they put together a simple program for editing, printing, and calculating checks. And that was called Quicken. Now, as it happens, he wasn't alone in seeing that market opportunity. And by the time they'd released their product, there were several others hitting the marketplace. But where Quicken turned out to be differentiated was it sucked in all the feedback from various focus groups and it had opted for beautiful ease of use. So a novice user could be up and running within 10 minutes. The competitors on the market were a feature-rich mess that you had uh, very long setup times, very high complexity, and there was sort of a product of engineering ego rather than consumer insight. And so when it came time to incorporate the company that would house Quicken, Cook decided to call it Intuit, which means to understand by intuition. And really, that is what he wanted his customers to experience when they interacted with the company's products. That's a fascinating history. The fact that it was led by a consumer packaged goods focused professional is really interesting. How did it evolve from Quicken to the core franchise of small business accounting and consumer tax that's known for today? 
on the small business side, the story sits somewhere between serendipity and making your own luck, but definitely back on that kind of consumer listening theme I just laid out. So a couple of years after Quicken had been launched, the team were putting in some survey content into the floppy disks that they sold in retail channels. And they'd inadvertently included a question as to what people were using the software for. Was it personal use or business or both? And to their surprise, around half the respondents identified as using the program for business, which didn't make any sense to the team. You know, why would small businesses be avid users of a personal finance tool? So there was an inclination to dismiss the findings, but Cook insisted they just rerun the survey and he jumped on the phone with the dozens of customers who had identified as business users. And what they discovered there were businesses were using Quicken as kind of a good enough solution to do bookkeeping. And that was really the formative insight behind QuickBooks, that the market was just radically underserved and, in fact, could do with a piece of formal bookkeeping software. But again, the same sort of caveat applied. They understood that if you're a small business owner or their spouse or the office manager, you didn't actually get into this to do accounting. So they abstracted away all of the complexity with this really simple user interface. Then on the tax side, that comes a few years later in the early 1990s. It was popular for PC makers to sell a bundle of software. So a few floppy disks. So let's call it Quicken for managing your personal finances, Excel for spreadsheets, and maybe TurboTax or tax cut for filing personal taxes. And around that time, Microsoft were making a real push with Excel. And they saw the other complements or the other components within that bundle as useful. So they made a low ball offer to inquire into it, which was rebuffed. And Upon being rebuffed, they decided they would get into the bundle directly. They launched a product called Microsoft Money directly to compete with Quicken. And so this gave rise to a defensive move. Fearing disintermediation, both Quicken and the makers of TurboTax decided they were better to bundle together formally. And so they consummated a merger. The way the whole thing played out was you know, Microsoft Money had failed to delight consumers. They'd outsourced all the consumer insight to external teams of PhDs. Cook had had his engineers sitting down directly with consumers hearing about their pain points and feedback. So then you fast forward to 1994, with Microsoft having failed to get into the space, they came knocking again and offered to acquire Intuit for one and a half billion dollars, a big price tag at the time, in today's terms, a measly 1% of the current market cap. It all just proved to be too soon after Microsoft's antitrust problems in the early 90s and it's ultimately blocked by the DOJ. And since then, you know, Microsoft have made several failed attempts to unseat each of Quicken, QuickBooks, and TurboTax. And every time, Intuit have defended their territory. So why do I give you that color? I guess, yes, there's a broad intrigue of the founding story. But I think at a base level, when we think about the evolution of Intuit, it's been born of this deep sense of paranoia, the, the world's biggest software business, could come and attack their business at any time. And ultimately, they've cleverly layered moats to their business and also stayed very focused on customer delight. So that overarching history gives me a better understanding of the core businesses and the history of them. I think it'd be interesting if we next can explore the value proposition of their products. And so I think you've touched on it briefly, but I guess I want to better understand the basic economic model of each of the four major businesses. And is it a software business? Is it a service business? Should this be considered SaaS? How do investors think about it? And then, you know, how are the products priced to the actual customer? So let's start with tax. It's a software product that delivers the tax questionnaire. You go through that process. And when you're happy with your return, you pay into it when you click and submit that return to the IRS. So if you're a low-income consumer, around 8 million of the 40 million returns that Intuit process, you don't pay anything. But above the income threshold, you generally do pay Intuit. The average revenue uh, per customer is around $60 overall for this. And that's about a quarter of what you would pay in an assisted channel, like a tax store or a CPA's office. So the basic value prop there is the convenience of not leaving the kitchen table and big price saving. I ultimately would class that as transaction software, but it's very reoccurring in nature. Taxes are mandatory. 
they're annual, they change a bit each season, and Intuit have a you know very solid position there. In the last couple of years, Intuit have been gaining real traction with an add-on or a premium service called TurboTax Live. So just to simplify, think about this as Uber, but for accountants rather than taxis. And so what that can allow you to do is be directly routed to a video chat with an accountant right at the point where you encounter a problem question. The routing will take you to an expert who actually is really proficient in that particular question. And ultimately, that solves some of the confidence issues around filing taxes online. On the QuickBooks side, they lead with the bookkeeping software, and that's pretty much conventional SaaS. A small minority are on desktop subscriptions, but it's all recurring revenue. And the median price paid by the consumer of that product is around 70 bucks a month. And then they may choose to add on payroll software or payment software. Payroll is, you know, per employee rate card and payments, if you're going to have invoices, issued and received payment on them, it's just a competitive rate of interchange on the car payments. So getting to the value prop, as I addressed in the opening comments, the vast majority of the market here is unpenetrated. They're on an improvised method of record keeping, maybe a shoebox of invoices and Excel. And QuickBooks is really offering them time savings. It's automation. You can directly ingest payments you've received from Square or invoices you paid via bill.com or the purchase records and supplies you bought on Amazon business. And so the small businesses that adopt this software generally report better cash flow management. They have higher survival rates than those that don't, and they get better access to capital. So it's a very solid value proposition for them. I'll briefly cover off the monetization model for MailChimp and what it is. So this is more traditional SaaS. So you're going to manage customer relationships in the MailChimp software run email and social media campaigns. And they've attracted 13 million users on a freemium model. But once your customer list or your email velocity reaches a certain size and scale, you're generally ushered into a paid offering of between 11 bucks a month or 300 bucks a month for a really heavy user. The value prop there is better access to growth, you know, customer acquisition in a managed way. And then finally, on Credit Karma, it's a leading consumer finance website, 100 million members, 38 million of them engaging monthly. And the members on the site are thoughtfully tracking their credit scores. They're seeking to understand how they can apply for financial products, understanding what would be pre-approved, high likelihood of approval, so that they don't suffer the kind of credit denial that would impair their credit score. And that is, you know, one of these familiar killer consumer internet models, free at the point of consumption and ad-supported. So it provides very good signal for, for advertisers of financial products because the folks there in one sense or another are there to understand how they can qualify for products. So very high search intent and attractive to advertisers. I'm sure we'll spend a little bit more time later in the conversation on why these businesses do or don't make sense together or even what was the imperative to bring them together over time. But I guess another aspect that I want to dig a bit deeper into is just as it's known today, QuickBooks is kind of the dominant plumbing in tax accounting software for small and medium-sized businesses. Maybe I'm right making the assumption that there are some weak network effects here and that accounting pros and businesses perceive something like QuickBooks to be the, the operating language of business and personal accounting software. I think about the way that financial professionals use Microsoft Office in a similar way. Is that the right way to think about how they kind of land and expand in the enterprise? Yeah, so I think your comparison to Microsoft Office in terms of selling productivity to non-technologists is an apt one. Another one that comes to mind is that QuickBooks, with its 90% market share of small business accounting in the US, sort of become the standard. I always recall a conversation with former CEO of Moody's, Ray McDaniel, who described his business as a standards business. You know, It's one where the network effects created by your past sales give you the right to make your next sale. And so when we think about those past sales for QuickBooks and its incumbency, there's some real advantages. And the first of those advantages takes hold with the accountant. So look, we covered off part of the value prop here is time saving and cash flow management for customers. There's a second thing that happens here. When you sit down with your accountant at the end of the year and you go to try and maximize your deductions, 
they need to have confidence that the records have been kept correctly. Anything less than perfection there, and they're going to err on the side of conservatism if they are having to forensically piece together their shoebox Excel method. And so accountants generally recommend to their small businesses they adopt QuickBooks. And the room for another player is somewhat stymied by that because if those accountants were having to sort of digest records each tax season from four or five, six different software providers, you can bet their practices would run a hell of a lot slower. So they act as a friendly referral channel, recommending QuickBooks to their clients. And they're very thoughtful about including the accountants in focus groups to run through potential product improvements and the roadmap for years ahead. And this all got tested about six or seven years ago, where an Australian accounting software firm called Zero tried to enter the US market. And they did so with a combination of competitive pricing and by offering referral commissions to the accounting community. But they just couldn't overcome the moat I described a moment ago. The accountants simply didn't want to gum up their practices by having a duplicate standard that looks slightly different. So today, if you look at the North American market, Intuit are 50 times the size of zero and growing faster in percentage terms and hugely faster in dollar terms. That's the accountants. The second network effect resides in sort of the ecosystem of complementary products. So most businesses can benefit from using accounting software. But where the real magic happens is where they sync other products to it, where information from other software just flows in there. And Intuit have always been clear-eyed about having an open platform with open APIs so that major apps can sync very nicely with QuickBooks. So today, around 40% of QuickBooks customers are connecting another app to that product. And if you actually think about the engineers at those third-party software companies, it's just not a big priority for them to write a good integration if there was a sort of third or fourth sort of ankle biter here coming into the market in accounting software and looking to link up with everybody. So that's another thing that sort of gates the ecosystem. This, to me, kind of seems like a business that in some ways thrives on complexity in the sense that the more changes there are to the tax code and credit standards, the more entrenched they become. And whether the economy is expanding or contracting, taxes and credit checks are a necessary evil. So can we kind of spend some time talking about that in the context of it being a barrier to entry for competition like Zero and Microsoft, which you've already alluded to? In the tax business, I guess, before you get to commercial competitors, you kind of have to understand why the government doesn't play a larger role in tax filing in the US. Whilst I don't have an American tax code to hand, if I did and I threw it down this table, it would make a very loud thud. The US has woven the delivery of their social security system and a myriad of different credits and deductions into the tax process. That just gives Intuit a lot of complexity to abstract away. So back to their kind of core competency of making simple things intuitive. That complexity also makes it hard for the US to sort of narrowly apply self-assessment with their own slimmed down software. There'd just be too many questions in the questionnaire. And the government, in fact, recently committed to, you know, a couple of years ago, committed to some legislation that said they would not enter the tax preparation category. So then that leads you with states. You know, you've got 50 different flavors of state tax. And the only state that tried historically was California to have a portal for self-filing taxes. But it really failed to gain traction. So think about that. America's largest state with no shortage of public spirited software engineers, they couldn't get traction with the product. So that's why the government's not there. As it pertains to tax complexity, I think in the past, Intuit would have liked to have seen that huge tome that is the tax code cut in half. It would have given a much greater sized cohort of tax filers the confidence that they could use a do it yourself platform. However, these days they've got TurboTax Live and a fully assisted lineup as well. And so at this stage, I don't think they dislike complexity. The second thing is around competition, commercial competition, let's call it. The number two provider in the US in the software category is H&R Blog. Many moons ago, they acquired a company called TaxCut. But outside of that, it's been quite hard for insurgents and upstarts. And the reason for that is tax season generally ends with the citizen either receiving their biggest check of the year or writing one of their biggest checks of the year. And so you want very high confidence that the calculation has been done correctly. And there's a big brand trust infused into that process. 
that has ultimately been hard for others to under, overcome. So I give an example, you know, Credit Karma, when they're a standalone business, had a free tax filing offering. And they were really running that as a play to try and gather information about consumers that they thought could build an even stronger credit profile, you know, an alt data type of concept that could strengthen their core business. With the full weight of the Credit Karma brand behind it and all its inserts in 40 odd million consumers, they were only able to get to about 3 million filers at peak, which is about 2% market share. And in the acquisition process, they had to divest that business to Jack Dorsey's block. And, you know, it's dwindled since then. It's down to one and a half million filers in a pretty short space of time. I think that just underlines what a hard space this is to compete in commercially. And then finally, going forward, all the connective tissue that Intuit have with the accounting community from QuickBooks helps them to offer this program in live and fully assisted. So they're out there with, you think about the company, I'm sure we'll cover the financial model. On a gap basis, 27, 28% of revenue spent on sales and marketing. It's this huge spend for challenges to overcome in terms of share of voice. And now they're able to amortize that across not only DIY taxes, but the much, much larger market of partially and fully assisted taxes. So John, you've done a fantastic job kind of laying out the key franchises of the business, the top of funnel mechanism and the network effects that afford them pretty defensive business model. But I think it would be really helpful to the audience if we kind of walk through the financial model for the business, the size and scale of revenue, growth, margins, returns on capital. How do you think through the financials of this business? For the year ended July, revenue was almost $13 billion. And the company's grown pretty consistently over time, every year since 1998, excluding 2015, which was only due to an accounting change around rateable revenue. In fact, the death and taxes angle, you know, in terms of inevitability, meant that they even grew in the great financial crisis at 4% year over year. So picture the recent context as double digit growth and then a number of large product introductions that are pretty durable that have accelerated that as of last year. So if you look at the organic growth or pro forma growth for the year just gone, Intuit grew at 24%. They beat the initial guide by eight percentage points. And for this year, their opening salvo on organic growth is 14 to 16%. So for a dollar of revenue, they turn about 80 cents of that into gap gross profit. The R&D to sales ratio is 18%. So plenty of vibrancy around the spend to drive new innovation. So really not resting on their laurels as to the stickiness of these products that I mentioned. Yeah, marketing is important. Tax is kind of a one-shot deal. It's over by the end of April every year. And so they run, from Super Bowl onward, they run a pretty heavy marketing campaign. They do that because, frankly, they think their penetration of the overall tax prep dollars in the US is still really low. So sales and marketing is about 27% of gap expenses. And that gets you to a gap operating margin of around 21%. Folks have different ways they like to think about amortization related to deals. I think you can look more kindly on that if you have a, you know, a positive outlook on the acquisitions that have been done. So we can talk about those later. But if you wanted to add back the non-cash amortization from deals, you get to kind of a 25% sort of cash operating margin. And then, frankly, there is stock-based comp, but that's all been defrayed through the various line items we've spoken to in a gap manner here. So then when it comes to free cash flow conversion, that is you know, well in excess of one and a half to two times the level of gap net income. But most of the delta there is stock-based comp. That's gone up in recent years as a function of the seizing of some new acquisitions into it becoming more of a higher growth company. But management have framed that and said they will now get leverage out of that line item. So they would expect stock-based compensations as a percentage of revenues here to stable or lever going forward. And in general, the company believe that they will grow revenue faster than expenses over time. So that's an operating principle that they have. And I guess one question that folks may have is the company have a stated mission, which used to be you know, around solving problems via software. And now he's articulating something on the orders of being an expert-driven platform. Will it be more of a body shot? And what does that do to margin? So, you know, I've diligenced this on the tax side with live component there is the biggest product today. And the pay away to H&R Blocks accountants is around 25%. I'd actually expect that to be lower inside of 
TurboTax Live because they're really fractionalizing the role of the accountant. Yeah, the accountant is using a fraction of the time to answer hard questions and use their brain. They're not rekeying somebody's data. And yeah, there are various other processes around document collection and APIs that can suck in things through your brokerage account and whatnot. That really means it's a much higher revenue yield for the accountant, but probably not the same amount of pay away for an intuits versus say an H&R block tax store. And so ultimately, the company's messaging around revenue growing faster than expenses makes sense to me. Okay, so this is a somewhat dominant business, but to your point, they still are projecting growth rates that are quite healthy. I guess I'd just love to learn more about the culture of the company and their managerial style that's allowed them to enjoy such sustainable growth for such a long period of time. What's kind of the secret sauce there? So this is actually one of Intuit's biggest sources of competitive advantage. And it can sometimes sound trite to say that culture is a source of competitive advantage, but it's worth just walking through a little bit of the history on this. So when Microsoft first came to challenge Quicken, the internal mantra of Intuit's resistance movement was that Microsoft can't match our depth of consumer empathy. And for a long time, Scott Cook would host his board meetings inside the customer contact center. Managers and engineers at all levels were required to spend 12 hours a month talking directly to customers on the phone. And actually, those sort of follow me home practices to learn from consumers continue even today. So some of it's around customer focus. Then there's the quality of the people and the mission. So when Microsoft made their overture to Scott Cook in 1994 to acquire Intuit, they offered to run it as an independent subsidiary. And you know, Gates said, this is the best culture I've identified outside of Microsoft. And we're buying you as much for your culture as your code. In fact, Microsoft had a pretty good track record of just rewriting the code of acquired companies anyway. And after that you know, deal went away with the DOJ stepping in, Book did some pretty unusual. He volunteered that he didn't think he was the right person to push the company to the next level of development. And they bought in a sort of longtime tech executive and college football coach called Bill Campbell. Coach Campbell was the subject of a pretty popular business biography recently called Trillion Dollar Coach. And it was written by three of the top Google executives to whom he'd been a mentor. He was also Steve Jobs' weekly sort of walking partner and an informal coach to a wide-ranging group of execs in Silicon Valley. Really just a unique individual. And I think he helped implement immensely high standards expected from the Intuit CEOs of the future and you know, a range of practices around people management and the ethos that when folks come to Intuit, they do so to do the best work of their careers. Putting that in a competitive context, you know, a strategic planning cycle at Intuit is three years. And so most of the CEOs they've had have generally completed two or two and a bit cycles of strategic planning. And I raise that because without meaning to denigrate them, I can observe that recently there was a 10-year span where H&R Block had five CEOs. So just over half of one of Intuit's strategic planning cycles. And so that starts to sort of inform a very different sort of molded consistency at Intuit relative to, say, H&R Block. Fortunately, Suzanne Gadazi, the new CEO, at, or relatively new CEO at Intuit, seems to be cut from the same cloth of strong leaders, you know, sharing many of the traits of those that have gone before him. Outside of just the C-suite, you're always looking for clues the culture has sustained outside of executives or alumni you can speak to on expert calls. And so I came across a podcast series a good while ago. A group of Intuit engineers based in India had been running to talk about life at Intuit. It was amazing to hear these engineers talk about how empowered they felt to solve consumer products at Intuit and how they loved being able to experiment systematically in trying to do so. And I'd note that Intuit has been on India's top three great places to work in each of the last three years. And Zach, they've got no right to be there. It's pretty much a US firm. 92% of the revenues are in North America. They're placing above Adobe, Cisco, Salesforce, who all have products in India. Folks can point their you know, former classmates towards and show them their innovation wares live in the marketplace. And Intuit only operates in a handful of countries. They're not a passport to all these exciting international cities that one could want to go and work in. But nonetheless, 
there they are. In order to do large-scale M&A, you have to have an amazing culture. The ability to integrate new businesses has failed many a very well-reared company. So perhaps it makes sense to talk about capital allocation historically for the company. So if I think back a decade ago, they exited a number of assets in the personal finance space. Quicken and Rock Financial, which became Quicken Loans and is now public as a large company called Rocket Mortgage. What happened there? So the acquisition of Rock Financial takes us back to a point in time in the late 90s. And I think what can be interesting sometimes is eras can dictate capital allocation. So when you're in sort of the haze of the new economy era and everything feels like the next adjacency could be the huge opportunity, companies in that type of era tend to be less focused on the core and accumulate more clutter without asking what problem they solve or what competitive advantage they bring to a given adjacency, if you like. And that was probably the way I define Intuit under Ed Harris, who was sort of the shortest lived CEO by tenure. But there was a view at the time about could Quicken be the front end of internet banking? And some banks believed it. What, you know, Wells Fargo wanted to do an exclusive agreement. E-Trade wanted to sell themselves to Intuit at the time because they worried about losing distribution if that was going to be the future. And so that's kind of the lineage of Rock Financial being part of Intuit. It went on to license the quicker name for its loan product. But under the leadership of Brad Smith, you know, in around 2013, Intuit needed to kind of come back to its core. And so they divested a digital bank they bought in 2007. They divested Quicken and Rocket Financial two or three years after that. And really, at that time, the pressing challenges were in the business or the core were three things. They needed to rewrite their code base to move QuickBooks from what had been a desktop ecosystem to an online ecosystem. It just the first iteration of the code hadn't worked and it needed a full rewrite, which is a heavy lift. The second thing was they could see all of these fledgling opportunities in live, but they needed to test and iterate to stand those up. And the third was international. You know, at the time, the company, I think, had, you know, four or five percent of its revenue from international. When you look at a software company at this size that has chops in solving problems that are global in nature, they were underserving international markets where, you know, frankly, you can identify some of the competition as being less skilled executors than Intuit and arguably less strong culturally as well. So Smith's era was really about refocusing on the core and shedding some of the bloat. So even though Rocket has been a very successful standalone company since then, I think it was a valid decision as we sit here for Intuit to refocus on the core. And I also think getting out of the way of underwriting financial products has or will allow them now that we sit here with the benefit of hindsight to execute on the full opportunity for an ad-driven model at Credit Karma. So perhaps that's a fantastic segue to get us into these large acquisitions of Credit Karma and MailChimp that have been made over the last couple of years. Presumably, investors are still making sense of those and how they fit into the value equation. But what was the impetus, the commercial imperative for them to make those acquisitions? And how are you thinking about what that means for the business today? So at some level, the acquisition of Credit Karma is kind of a back to the future type of concept. If you read the speeches of Bill Campbell from the late 90s, he was really focused on whether Quicken could become an asset that delivered free services around personal finance to consumers that was automated, could get you the best deal, and was monetized via an ad-driven model. And I think when Credit Karma really started to scale, that was finally the delivery of that vision. You know, a company that had really broken out in terms of its reach with consumers, 100 million members, 40 million monthly actives, and potentially its frequency. You can envisage lots of ways to get folks to use Credit Karma more frequently, and I'll touch on that in a second. The other thing I think that Intuit thought they could uniquely bring to Credit Karma was the synergy of the data. So Intuit knows an awful lot about consumers. They have verified income data. People generally don't overstate how much they earn in a tax return. 
They know if you've had various life events, if you've bought stocks or rental property for the first time, if you've just got married or divorced. And so there are a number of life events that inform the way we will conduct our financial lives that will leave those artifacts in the tax return. And so ultimately, I think what Intuit perceive is a huge opportunity to strengthen and deepen the data set at Credit Karma and make it vastly more valuable to its users. I think that does a great job contextualizing the Credit Karma acquisition. To me, MailChimp seems a lot less intuitive. How does that one fit into the puzzle here? So MailChimp, we talked about earlier, is software for small businesses to communicate, manage, and grow the customer base, mainly through email and social campaigns. And if you recall how Intuit conceived of the opportunity in QuickBooks, because you had all this off-label use of Quicken by small businesses, it sort of happened again here. So small businesses in the U.S., have on some level been trying to use QuickBooks as a CRM. There's about 4 billion customer records stored in QuickBooks. It should very much admit that they are not a CRM. And so I think that's one basis for understanding the need to offer their consumers something more in this domain. I think the second thing to underline is the most important goal for small businesses is to find and retain customers. So bookkeeping is very much a, an afterthought. And when you think about the life cycle of a small business, they will be out there trying to find customers long before they're filing an annual set of accounts or moving off some informal means of keeping their records. So the second vector here is even if everyone ends up at QuickBooks in the end as their accounting software, they've generally made other choices about payroll and payments and CRM long before that. This is an opportunity for the QuickBook family, including MailChimp, to interact with customers at an early stage before they've made payroll and payment decisions. And that matters because those attached services are far larger TAMs than the one described by small business accounting. The third consideration is that MailChimp has done a great job scaling internationally. So whereas you look at QuickBooks, there's a you know, rare example here of a $120 billion software company in Intuit with only 8% international revenue, the split's more like 50-50 with MailChimp. And they've done that virally. The company is one of these really odd examples of a private software company that was actually over-earning. They were bootstrapped since inception, never took an outside penny of VC capital and had no stock-based compensation running through the company. And so they have a product virality that can now be this outpost domestically and internationally and intersect customers before they made other technology decisions. So when you put the whole thing together, you have a suite that small businesses can run their business on. And you have this earlier point of outreach from the Intuit family to the small businesses. A nice top of funnel mechanism, perhaps, for customer acquisition. I would be remiss if I didn't ask the question in regards to potential risks with this business. And so it's not one that lacks controversy in that If you think about it, if the tax code was simplified, the demand for their product would be less, intuitively so. And so the way to think about it is I presume that it's in their best interest that taxes remain complicated and scary. Is there anything that they've been doing to try to stop the push towards what would be kind of pre-filled returns or simplifying the tax code? Well, I think the company would describe the motion around tax simplification as having the opposite effect, at least at some level. Their thought process is that the reason why 60% of Americans and 85% of the tax prep dollars are stuck in assisted mechanisms is because of the complexity of the tax system. And so more of those dollars would move over to lighter solutions like DIY or Live if we had a dramatic simplification of the tax code. Then there's a question of what in practice the US will ever manage to unpick here. You've got 50 different flavors of state tax and a myriad of different benefits and deductions encoded through the tax code. And so those would all have to go off for bipartisan bill to agree on all the simplifications, when in reality, it's just small components of the Republican Party that occasionally float the idea of sort of radical tax simplification. That idea doesn't seem to take flight in the center as much. 
when we look at the idea of lobbying or what the import of insurance position might be, you know, they point out that they are providing free filing to eight to 10 million Americans and have spent the last several tax seasons sort of getting rid of fees that apply at lower end, things like the convenience of uploading prior year data and other types of services. So they essentially have gone to fully free. And even if we imagined that there was some political movement that wanted to convene sort of free tax filing, Intuit has successfully competed against commercial offerings of free in the not too distant past, with Credit Karma tax being an example. When I roll all of that up and I combine it with the federal government having legislated now to not enter the tax prep category, I feel better about the balance of the risks. From a bold perspective, this is a business that ostensibly should grow a GDP plus a couple percentage points, but it's consistently been able to grow at a pace well in excess of GDP. What are the key drivers of that? So I think the summary would be that Intuit is selling digitization of irritant necessities, filing taxes or keeping books. Nobody sort of wakes up in the morning wanting to do those things. And the digital penetration of both is low. So you know, rehearse this over their share of US tax dollars is in the mid-teens today, but they now have a live product that is cheaper and more convenient than the bricks and mortar alternative. On the small business side, they have 6 million businesses on their accounting products. You know, It's less than 10% penetrated when they look at the viable businesses who could benefit from a product like that to manage cash flow. On payments, there are 2 trillion of invoices on Intuit's rails. Their charge volume is only 120 billion. So you know, mid-single digit penetration. Well, now they're enabling those invoices for instant or early payment, and they can take that share higher. Payroll is just an enormous market. They have you know, the on-ramp of having that product work very well with QuickBooks. In some cases, a minority of cases, you know, companies set up the accounting platform very early in the company lifecycle, and that's just a good port of call to choose payroll offering, but that market is enormous as compared to Intuit's overall revenues, let alone their uh, small business revenues. And then over in Credit Karma, but they only have mid-single digit penetration of leads that get converted for those types of products online that can go much higher. So really, as you come back to each facet of the business, you still have very low levels of penetration and increasing value that the company can offer. So just touch on that very briefly. One thing Sassan Gadazi has brought to bear is a suite of products that add more value at a higher price. And I think this can do a couple of things. So if you look at TurboTax Live, that product is generally twice the price of just doing a DIY filing. And one of the reasons folks generally churned out of TurboTax, they had about 25% annual churn, which is going to sound high, is because some life event would change. They wouldn't know how to answer the question in the return. Well, now you have lives. So not only is it a product that can hugely boost lifetime value via higher ARPU, but it also can make a massive dent on the churn related to uncertainty or lack of confidence. On the QuickBooks side of things, they've got now a product called QuickBooks Advance. So when you think about churn there, it's about 20%. Half of that is just the birth death of small businesses, which is better for QuickBooks users than it is overall, but frankly, still 10 points. And the rest is folks outgrowing QuickBooks software. So you move out of that category, you've got one to 10 employees, and you need to move to a more sophisticated program. If, frankly, customers kick and scream not to do it. There was a period in the run-up to Google's IPO where they were begging Intuit to you know, add more fields to QuickBooks because they didn't want the inconvenience of the switch. Uber ran a multi-hundred million dollar business on the $70 SKU of QuickBooks. And so customers generally don't want to do the migration or move up to vastly more expensive mid-market software. And Intuit have now put in this product called QuickBooks Advance. So that is three times the cost of the base QuickBooks. And it addresses that, if you want to call it, involuntary churn. The folks are really only moving out because... They'd slightly outgrown the product, but they haven't grown to the degree where they need a NetSuite or a Sage offering that could be dramatically more expensive than the products I'm outlining. So base level digitization and then more recently, high value products that solve customer problems and therefore 
will address some of the churn that you've seen historically in QuickBooks and TurboTax Life. Excellent job laying out the financial profile of the business, its rich founding history, its corporate M&A story. One question we love to finish these conversations on is, as someone who's studied this business deeply from a financial perspective, what are some of the lessons that investors can take away? And given the amount of competition in the financial software space, what are some lessons that can be borrowed from into it and applied to those building those businesses? So, you know, it's become popular to sort of lord software as a service as, as you know, among the best business models ever. I'm sympathetic to that argument, but I think it tends to get overstated when the product being sold is two IT procurement departments whose actual job it is to proactively sort of vet and adopt new technologies. So with Intuit, there have been times, I spoke about the era of Brad Smith, where the code base wasn't necessarily in the best health, but Intuit enjoyed time to react. There was a time when Xero had a slightly disruptive offering and Intuit enjoyed the time to react. And the reaction time is sort of a function of the greater degree of monogamy you have when you've ingrained into a workflow of a non-technologist. For those folks, they don't want to relearn up the learning curve of new software. They didn't get into business to do accounting or to mess around with accounting software. And so that does buy you reaction time. And so the jump ball of how to navigate some shift in tech paradigms for these types of companies tends to be, you know, every 10 years, not every three to four. The second thing is, you know, when we speak about great business models, that's really an abstraction. I mean, none of us get to invest in business models per se. What's accessible is ownership stakes in companies. And those companies have to have teams of people that you trust to execute as the terrain changes. You know, you're going to be generally paying a premium to the S&P 500 to buy these types of businesses. And the goodness that you extract really needs a longer time horizon. And when you start thinking about long time horizons, then you have to think about culture. That matters a ton over time. And then the third observation is many software businesses sound amazing when you layer on the various switching barriers, the high returns enjoyed by their customers. And they sound like a great mousetrap to not have their own return invested capital sort of revert to the mean. But I think where those returns do leak away and seep back into the economy is via stock-based compensation that you've got to pay to engineer and salespeople. Yes, that's a fact of life for technology companies. The engineers, it's possible to imagine they can be more mission-driven and culture orientated. The salespeople are more likely to be coin-operated. And I think it can be quite difficult to earn really good gap operating margins and high return on invested capital, a high proportion of free cash flow that actually accrues to owners over time, all of those things. I think that's difficult if you've got to pay a cohort of engineers and salespeople. And so generally, we talked about Intuit, they're among a class of sort of self-service technology businesses that don't have to employ salespeople and enjoy that sort of white hot competition that takes place over in that market, especially recently. Maybe the last one for investors and one for operators. One thing I like about Intuit and sort of discussing its history is I read somewhere that a good moat should be littered with the dead bodies of your competitors or failed competitors. And so I think in Chewit, we can rehearse over whether it's Microsoft or Xero or Credit Karma when they're a standalone tax offering that was free. The various companies that have tried and failed to incur on Intuit's market position and their moat. And there's just a vast number of technology businesses out there today that trade at very rich multiples, where ultimately the moat has not been tested. And then switching gears to operators. As I study Intuit's history, I sort of come back to the question you asked me about, how did they end up with Rock Financial under their ownership? And that period in the late 90s, where shiny objects were very abundant and the company ultimately strayed from its core Sometimes companies and their underlying shareholders can view every adjacency as an opportunity for another profit pool. But customers don't think in terms of adjacencies. They don't think filing my taxes DIY, maybe I'll do DIY retirement planning. And so you can imagine adjacencies, but you really need to think in terms of customer problems. And that's one thing that I think Intuit's done it unbelievably well over time. Well, John, thank you for joining us. This has been a completely thorough and incredibly interesting breakdown of Intuit. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. My pleasure. 
To find more episodes of breakdowns ranging from Costco to Visa to Moderna, or to sign up for our weekly summary, check out joincolossus.com. That's J-O-I-N-C-O-L-O-S-S-U-S dot com.